Honorable Member for Provence. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and um, it's a pleasure for me to rise in the House this evening. I think this is an important topic, and I appreciate that the member of Beaches East York has brought this legislation forward and prompted the discussion that we're having here today. I can certainly understand how after the past two years of COVID, there are those who feel that we need to get something like this done immediately. Nobody wants COVID or something worse to hit Canadians. Our, our first priority as parliamentarians is the safety and security of our citizens. We have to take the time to properly reflect on and examine what we've just gone through to have a meaningful conversation about how to respond to future pandemic. Now the bill's proposal that the Minister of Health and other government ministers be the ones to put together or even make up the advisory committee to review their own response to the coronavirus is frankly quite ridiculous. That's like having the fox guard the hen house because they all have a very vested interest in the outcome. Canadians will never get the answers they deserve if these same ministers who perpetuated or promoted many of the failures, the abuses and the violations of charter rights that we've seen over the past two years are the same ones tasked with reviewing their own government's response. Let's face it, transparency and accountability and frankly honesty are hardly synonymous with this government. We've seen firsthand much of the misinformation propagated by these ministers. That's why I would propose before embarking on some of the elements contained in C-293, we need a full, nonpartisan, national inquiry into how governments at all levels have handled the response to COVID-19. Because as I reflected on the past two years, there are just too many questions. Questions that have not only never been answered by government, but in many cases, no one in government or the media have even had the courage to publicly ask. And herein, we have the first major issue in the, in the government's handling of COVID. It's the my way or the highway, we know best, you don't dare ask questions about what we're doing approach that the governments across this country have taken. We kept hearing, follow the science. We're following the science. Well, political science, yes. But the last time I checked, a big part of doing real science involved asking questions, analyzing data, and doing so with a rigorous, rigorous skepticism. You make an observation, you research the topic, you form a hypothesis, you test the experiments, you analyze the data, and you report your conclusions as objectively as you can based solely on the empirical data. That's the scientific method. In the case of COVID, the government never really got beyond forming a hypothesis. They based their response on the assumptions that they and many in the medical field made in the early days of COVID, which led to selective and oft often misleading use of data being collected and used to back up those assumptions. The media also failed in their objectivity to ask questions, choosing instead to parrot government talking points as truth, sowing fear and division, as they quietly pocketed millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in government subsidies. They refused to allow different points of view. They didn't ask the tough questions, and they silenced or mocked anyone who did. Canadians should not need for, to fear repercussions in their workplace, their communities, their professional associations, online or by the media. But that's what happened. Anyone who questioned anything related to the government's handling of COVID, any level of government, got smeared, bullied and cancelled. In a free and democratic society, that should be deeply concerning to all of us. Government made huge demands of Canadians and it is incumbent on governments at all levels to provide empirical data to back up their actions. We owe that to Canadians. So I sat down the other night as I prepared to deliver this speech today and I started to write down some of those nagging questions. Questions that we cannot trust this government to ask because they have sought so diligently for two years to cover up the answers from Canadians for their own political purposes. So I'm going to take the remaining time here to ask some of those questions. For a start, why did the government make the decision in 2019 to shut down our pandemic early warning system? We had SARS, we had H1N1, we knew the potential of a Canadian epidemic. Who chose to shut it down? Who in this government was responsible for leaving Canadians defenseless? Why was there so much conflicting information provided by government and public health officials? There were days when the WHO said one thing, Dr. Tam said another, and in my province of Manitoba, Dr. Rusin said something completely different, all on the same issue. This bread 
confusion, fear, and mistrust. Again, think this is the type of issue this legislation, at least in part, may be trying to address. But again, we can't address these issues until we know firsthand what took place, who was responsible, and we can't trust this government to provide us with those answers. We learned how the Public Health Agency of Canada, the same department responsible for the government's COVID response, had allowed our National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, one of our nation's foremost secure facilities, to be infiltrated by Chinese spies with direct links to both the Wuhan lab and the bioweapons program of the People's Liberation Army. Why? The government sued Parliament to cover it up. They refused to come clean. And then they turn around and make a deal with China to be the sole manufacturer of Canada's vaccine supply. The deal ultimately fell through, but there are a lot of questions here and, and questions that, that require answers. Why does the government refuse to release procurement details, like the price per dose, when other governments have been transparent? There are still legitimate questions related to vaccine safety and efficacy. Why did the government agree to hide the safety data for Pfizer for, Pfizer for 75 years? 51,714 Canadians have suffered vaccine injuries to date as a result of their COVID shots. 10,501 serious reactions, including 874 anaphylactic reactions, 1,342 cases of myocarditis, 140 thrombosis cases, and 382 reports with an outcome of death were reported following vaccination. Where does that information come from, Mr. Speaker? From the government's own website. You can look it up. Many reports of doctors refusing to even file a, a VAERS report, which is a vaccine adverse event reaction report. How many of those individuals have been compensated by the government vaccine injury program? To date, eight. Why is the media quiet about those things? Why is it the Prime Minister was more interested in his political fortunes than in public health? We saw this in his decision to call an unnecessary election last fall. We've seen this in his unacceptable rhetoric demonizing those who chose not to be vaccinated and his heavy-handed approach to dealing with vaccine mandate protests. One minute our truckers are essential workers, heroes who kept our country going, the next they're villains so awful that the Emergency Act was invoked to deal with them. And I think the inquiry and ultimately history will show just what an unjustified and politically motivated response that was. There are also serious questions related to government spending. The Liberal government spent unprecedented amounts, hundreds of billions of dollars to fight COVID, but their own parliamentary budget officer shows that at least 40% of that money, $205 billion, never went to fighting COVID. So where did it go? We know tens of millions of dollars have found their ways into pockets of Liberal cronies as this government paid exponentially more for ventilators and other medical equipment that was never used and now sits collecting dust in warehouses. Who all got rich while Canadians suffered? Why did the government refuse to put any safeguards in place for CERB, resulting in three million people, including criminals in jail, receiving the CERB benefit? Why did they send federal public servants home at a time when five million Canadians had lost their jobs and were forced into government programs and unable to access services? Why are they still at home? My office stayed open every day over the past two years to help Canadians. We did it safely. We had no issues with COVID. There is no reason other government officials and agencies could not have done likewise. Canadians are paying their salaries and public servants need to get back to the office and back to work full-time for Canadians. We could keep going on here all evening. We could talk about divisive and unscientific <coughs> mandates. We could talk about the disastrous arrived CANAP. We could also talk about the government's actions, how it destroyed border communities, separated loved ones. We could talk about how Canadians were assaulted in quarantine hotels. We could talk about provinces and their responses, the draconian measures that, in my view, did far more long-term harm than good. The questions go on and on. They deserve answers, Mr. Speaker. Over the past two years, governments have made big demands of Canadians. Canadians stepped up again and again, only to have their hopes dashed by this government and with their failures and broken promises as the goalposts got moved over and over again.
Canadians deserve empirical justification for those mandates. History will show those mandates were based on politics, not public health. After two years of sickness, restrictions, divisions and fear, governments of all levels need to be held accountable for their actions. Bill C-293 is insufficient because the government, any government, cannot and should not be trusted to investigate themselves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The debate continue, continuing debate. Uh,